You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we thank you so much for joining us each week. I want to remind you guys, our website is live, up, and running. Hazardground.com is the place to go. We have a bunch of previous episodes as well as picks and bios about some of our guests, more information, just lots of good stuff there. Hazardground.com, the place to go. Reminder, please get on your social media sites and leave us a rating and review. Let us know what you think about the podcast. If you can go to iTunes as well, leave a review there and a rating. That certainly helps create more popularity for the podcast and lets everybody know what we're doing. So we appreciate that as well. This week's guest is one of a kind. We step outside the bounds of our normal guests where we have military veterans on and service members. He is an American author, novelist, and filmmaker. Some of his work you'll know very, very well. His first book was a bestseller, The Perfect Storm, A True Story of Men Against the Sea. Uh, And then he went on to more war documentaries and war writing, including the war in Afghanistan, documentary films like Restrepo and Korangal, and his book War. He is Sebastian Younger on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Sebastian, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. So uh, interesting background that you have. You know, we've talked to a lot of authors and even filmmakers, both who are former military members and not military members. So kind of just give us the start and how you got your background in this career field. Well, I uh, I studied anthropology in college and um, I didn't do much with it after college. I did construction for a while and I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a journalist and um, I wound up as a climber for three companies. And, um, I hurt myself pretty badly with a chainsaw. I hit my leg with the saw at one point, and, and it, I, I was almost 30, and it got me thinking, like, i got to get my life together. And it got me thinking about writing about dangerous jobs. Um, I lived in a fishing town called Gloucester in Massachusetts, and the first dangerous job that I attempted to write about was commercial fishing, and that actually became my first book, uh, The Perfect Storm, which was a bestseller, um, to my surprise. Um, but I was also interested in uh, war reporting, and so I, there was a civil war in Bosnia, and I went off to Sarajevo in 1993. Sarajevo was besieged by the Bosnian Serb army, and it was my first exposure to war. And I kept, um, so I was back home, I was an author, and overseas I was a war reporter. I had this sort of split life. And so I went, a couple of years later, I went to Afghanistan in 1996. I was in Afghanistan, I kept going back there. Uh, then after 9-11, that obviously had, you know, renewed importance for this country. Uh, I was in West Africa a lot in the Liberian Civil War in Sierra Leone. Um, and then uh, eventually I was, uh, I did something I never thought that I'd have occasion to do or interest in doing. I, I was uh, with a platoon of American soldiers in, in eastern Afghanistan. And, you know, I wasn't with the Afghans, which I was used to. I was with American soldiers. And, uh, uh, and I I loved it. I mean, it was an incredible experience and probably the high point of my, professionally the high point of my career. So tell me, like, when you'd make the decision to go to Bosnia, and again, Bosnia was a different type of war, at least from an American perspective, right? Most of it was fought at 30,000 feet. We didn't really, even though we had troops on the ground, they were never engaged in hand-to-hand combat. But when you kind of want to start that whole experience, I mean, do you approach the State Department? How did you end up getting to Bosnia? Well, we, when I was in Bosnia, the U.S. was not there. Actually. Okay. We didn't come in until after the um, state peace accords were signed. Um, uh, I mean, we didn't come in on the ground until after Dayton. Um, uh, so I was there in 93, so it was a civil war. And um, I, I, you know, I was with um, civilians, basically, inside Sarajevo. Interesting. And, so all, and these, go ahead, I'm all sorry. these wars that I covered, I was not with American soldiers until 07. Got it. So okay. all those wars I listed, like Afghanistan in 96, obviously, there are no Americans. There. I mean, I for me, war reporting was really being with indigenous people, local people, caught in a civil war, you know, between militias and whatever. Like that's, for me, that's what war, most of my life, that's what war has been. And what did you learn from that? I mean, that's interesting because so often it's, you know, good guys versus bad guys in the way it goes. But in a civil war, I mean, I suppose they're, you don't know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are because they both feel like they're right. Yeah, it depends. I mean, it was pretty, you know, in Afghanistan in 96, it was pretty clear that the Taliban were the bad guys. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know what I mean? Like, they, and Al Qaeda was in there already, and I was writing about uh, Al Qaeda training camps in Tora Bora outside Jalalabad. Um, 
the summer of 96, right when the Taliban were taking over. So, you know, you're, you know, there's still, uh, I mean, good and bad is too um, black and white, really. But, but usually the, your perspective is that these civil wars are enormously harmful to civilians, and these wars are not being really tracked or paid attention to by the American public, the American government. So your job as a journalist is to bring these tragedies to light in the hope that, you know, the world will do something, which is what happened in Sarajevo. And eventually, after three years of carnage, NATO stepped in and and bombed the Bosnian Serb forces into backing off and eventually brought, you know, sort of bombed their way to, to, to a peace accord, basically, which was the right thing to do. They just took three years too long to do it. When you're telling that story, and, and does it feel like no one's listening? I mean, as you said, you're seeing the horrors happen day in and day out, both you know to civilians and everything else, and, and yet no action is being taken by you know the, the smarter, bigger countries who are supposed to be involved in this thing, or at least helping you know ensure that total destruction doesn't occur. What, what's that feeling like when you're reporting on this, and, and you're not really getting a reaction that that you're hoping to get, or were you even looking for a reaction? Yeah, I mean, you're. I mean, you're hoping that. I mean, military intervention is um, can be a really quick solution to a civil war. I mean, in Liberia, the American Marines came ashore and really didn't, literally, did not need to fire a shot in the war. Uh, Sierra Leone, it took 500 SAS, um, you know, two weeks to to end the Sierra, the civil war in Sierra Leone and a couple of attack helicopters. I think that's all it took. They lost one guy. Um, so it can be, you can, it can work, but, but more importantly, there's diplomatic pressure, economic pressure. I mean, there's sanctions and there's all kinds of things you can do. Um, if the, if the sort of big governments want to do that and, you know, in Bosnia, which is, I mean, sorry, it was two hour drive from Vienna, something like that. And the Bosnian Serb army surrounded that city and used the civilians for target practice for three years and they killed or wounded a fifth of the population of the city, men, women, children, everybody. And that, you know, that was, that's a day's drive from Vienna. Nobody did a damn thing. So yeah, the report people in Sarajevo, the reporters all were thinking, what's it going to take? What kind of, what kind of journalism is it going to take to get the world to act? And eventually they did in 95 and it brought the war to an end pretty quickly. On the flip side, you talk about reporting in Afghanistan in 96 uh, and clearly no action was taken then, at least not on, on a scale that anybody was aware of, but you had an inside track to everything that was going to happen on 9-11, so when it does happen uh, and you see the events unfold, what was your reaction? Kind of, Were you surprised? or I mean, that, that's got to be a little bit surreal when 9-11 happens. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was writing about the Al-Qaeda training camps in 96. The Taliban took over... Um, I was back there in 2000 with Massoud. I was with the Northern Alliance <clears throat> when they were fighting the Taliban and Al Qaeda in, in the north in Badakhshan. Um, you know, back then the Taliban had an air force. They had MIGs. They had tanks. You know, I mean, they had everything, right? And and Massoud was the rebel. It was basically the guerrilla guerrilla force, right? right. And, and um, so I was I was with him. I mean, literally with him. And uh, and I remember him saying. Um, uh, he said, you know, he had really good intelligence from the other side. He said, there's going to be a big attack in the West and probably in America. Uh, it's coming in the next year. So he didn't know quite what or when or where or how. Uh, but he, I mean, he, he said it, 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 it. I remember what he, his words. He said, the pain that my country, meaning Afghanistan, has suffered for years, your country will soon experience. And it's because of the same cancer that's growing in Afghanistan. And um, that cancer being al-Qaeda. And, you know, he tried to warn the French about it. Um, I'm sure he tried to warn the U.S. He had pretty good context with um, U.S. intelligence. And, uh, you know, I just know what he did anything. Yeah, I mean, it's it's chilling just to hear it. And, of course, we know after the fact that the CIA had, you know, levels of intel that they, they, a supposed attack was coming. And, look, all that's water under the bridge. There's no need to rehash it right now. But, I mean, when you hear that as a journalist, how much – Severity? Did you take it with at that point in time? Did you feel like he was a guy who was just spouting out stuff? No, no, no. He was. I mean, I knew he was serious, and I. I mean, I. When I came back, uh, I was contacted by U.S. intelligence. Um, they, I don't know how, would think I was over there and wanted to know what I, you know, what I'd seen, what I'd heard, what I thought, and um, you know, I told them all that stuff, and. Um, 
I had the sense that they were sort of supportive of Masood and might have even been giving him material support. Like, I mean, I mean at one point the guy asked, what do they need? Do they need helicopter rotor blades? Do they need land mines? Like, what do they need? And uh, <clears throat> I wasn't sure what to say, actually, because I couldn't tell at that point is he with, is he for or against Masood? If he's asking what do they need, is that a way of finding out what they're short of? Or is he really sincere that he wants to get, like, I, I didn't, and, and of course I'm a journalist, so you're not even supposed to be playing this game in the first place. Right. So I, I, you know, I figured it was safe to say, you know, there's a lot of refugees within his, or internally displaced people that have been pushed out from the fighting into a, a sort of refuge of Masood's area, Masood controlled. Um, but they're a huge burden uh, on the infrastructure and on his resources and, um, these people are really hungry and really what they need is food. You need to get food in there. I have no idea if he did, but I felt as a journalist, it's always ethical to recommend that, you know, hungry people could be brought food. So I didn't think there was a, 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 an ethical issue there. So fast forward through all that, as you go through working with indigenous people and everything else, you know, nine 11 happens and the war breaks out in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq. And, and you end up, as you said before, uh, falling in with an American unit. Uh, how did that whole thing happen? Well, you know, the Taliban, I, I went back and uh, after 9-11, I was with Masood's forces when they took Kabul, um, which was pretty pretty exciting, you know, to see a city liberated. Uh, extremely exciting. And, um, you know, the Taliban were such a paper tiger, tiger. I mean, they just fell over, you know. And so no one thought the war was going to last very long um, because the resistance just collapsed. And the Afghans were so thrilled that the Americans had basically saved them from these people. And uh, I mean, even Pashtuns, you know, the Taliban works, well, just about exclusively Pashtun, and, and even the Pashtuns were pretty psyched about it. So it was done, you know, and, and George Bush was ginning up a war in Iraq. And so, you know, I, I refused to cover that because I was against it. And I didn't think I could be objective about it. Um, but most of the press corps was rushing off to that. And, you know, so basically what happened is the U.S. left... Um, a very small force there. I mean, a very small footprint, like 15,000 soldiers. There's 40,000 cops in New York City where I live. You know, clearly an inadequate force. And, <laughs> That's a uh, great comparison, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, and, I mean, and, sort of, and the size of New York is minuscule compared to what you're dealing with in Afghanistan, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, um, you know, there's a lot of people on the island, but still, it's like, it's, it was a, it's a, you know, Afghanistan was a big, complex, messed up, damaged country and it needed a lot of love and a lot of help and a lot of security. And we left 15,000 troops there and moved on to a war that in my opinion was not necessary at that time. And, um, so the Afghans of course are pretty pragmatic people. They knew this wasn't going to work. And understandably they were pretty reluctant to commit to the project because they knew if it went badly, you know, it was their heads getting cut off by the Taliban. So to the extent that we even had allies, I, I, you know, I'm surprised. Like, I'm, I'm amazed the Afghans actually dared associate with us as much as they were glad to see the Taliban gone. We just did not come in with enough uh, enough of our presence. Um, and so I, um, you know, after, after 9-11, I watched Kabul fall. I left. I didn't think the war, I thought the war was over. And then to my horror, I watched you know, what happened in Iraq, and I watched Afghanistan sort of come unglued. And so by 2007, I thought, you know, I'm going to, or 2005, I thought, I'm, we're going to be there for a long time. I need to know what it's like to be an American soldier in combat in this country that I know so well from the other side. And uh, so I was just randomly placed by a public affairs person um, at Bagram. I was randomly placed with a battle company of the 173rd. Now, did you contact and, Army Public Affairs? Sorry to cut you off, but did you contact Army Public Affairs? Or how did that, I mean, just take me through the ins and outs. Yeah, yeah there's a, I can't remember. It was a while ago, but there's a whole way to do it. I mean, you get, I think I called the Pentagon, and they, you know, you. I think I faxed my info to the Public Affairs Office at Bagram. And so they knew I was coming. And I mean, it's like filling out a, it's like a play for a credit card. I mean, it really is not a big deal. Right. I mean, I, w I was a certified journal. You know, I mean, I was working for sure. a, a magazine. So, so, and for a, a TV network. So you have to be accredited, but, I, you know, it's not a, it's not a complicated thing to embed with the U.S. military. And, and then it's up to their, their, um, 
uh, it's their decision what kind of unit that they'll place you with. I mean, if you're 80 pounds overweight and, you know, whatever, if, you know, they're not going to put you in a combat, you know, like combat unit, right? So it, people do get placed with appropriate units. I'm I'm pretty strong. I'm pretty fit. Like, I covered a lot of wars. They knew that. So they stuck me with a kind of uh, high-speed unit, the battle company of the 173rd. And I just totally fell in love with those guys. I mean, I, you know, I grew up during Vietnam when the military's reputation was pretty complicated in this country. And that war, you know, cast a long shadow on, on my generation growing up with that. And sure. I, I, I honestly did not know what to expect from the U.S. military. I mean, I had no idea. I, you know, I didn't, um, I didn't know any soldiers. You know, I grew up, you know, I was, when I was, in, you know, I grew up during the 80s. You know, I was turned... 18 to 1980, and, and, you know, it's basically a couple of decades of peace. So um, I didn't know what to expect, and I just thought they were amazing. I, I just was, like, bowled over by the sort of quality of those young men. And I just thought, shit, if they go back to Afghanistan, you know, I refuse to cover Iraq, but if they go back to Afghanistan, I want to follow these guys for a whole deployment. And um, so that's what happened. What stood out to you the most? I mean, I know you just talked about how impressive they were, but I mean, give me some examples of and some adjectives of really kind of what you remember the most about that about Battle Company One Seventy Third. Well, I mean, they worked so damn hard. I mean, they were out on a two week combat operation on foot in Zabul in December when it was kept, you know down to zero at night, or I don't know what. It was unbelievably cold, and they're sleeping. You know, they're sleeping outside, right? And we are sleeping outside, and they're you know I remember. You know, we were moving at night, and the guys were, you know, some of the, you know, the mortar team was carrying 150 pounds probably with the tube and the mortars and everything else. I, was, I mean, they were just like superhuman. They were small dudes, right? They were big, big guys. They're just normal looking people, but they just would not quit. They would not stop. And they were working harder. I mean, I, I know this wasn't why they were doing it. They were doing it because of the US, US military, and this is what they're told to do. But in a sense, they were working harder for Afghanistan than I'd ever seen my, you know, the guys I knew at college, I'd ever seen them work for the United States, for America. You know, like, I was just, that really, that really, really impressed me. Uh, it's great to hear. And what did you notice about the camaraderie of the guys? Did that, did that stand out to you? Yeah, they just looked like they were having a really good time. Like, I mean, I've been on construction crews and work crews and all that, and you can get a bunch of guys together and give them a shitty situation, they will joke about it right. pretty quickly, <laughs> you know? And uh, it's, you know, sort of one of the earmarks in some ways of, of, of male uh, interaction. And, like, the worse the circumstances, the funnier it gets. And so they were pretty they were pretty damn funny. And I just, you know, they were just really professional. You know, we got into one pretty good firefight, and I just, like, no, I'd never been in a firefight with American forces before. I mean, all my associations of that are like Black Hawk Down and Apocalypse Now. You know, I never right. thought I'd see that in my lifetime. You know, growing up during Vietnam, I just never thought we would be in this situation again. And so I really couldn't believe what was happening around me when that kicked off. And, uh, you know, they were just so professional. And then at one point, um, the platoon started, we were, we were doing a patrol and we came across uh, um, a couple that had a young child on the back of a of a donkey or a mule or something and a donkey eggs. And, um, and it was cold as hell, right? It's late afternoon. And the child's feet, it, 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 the child was barefoot. Oh. And, um, and Sergeant Caldwell, uh, who was the platoon sergeant at the time, um, later became first sergeant on the next deployment. But, um, he said, he said to the translator, he said, you go to that compound where all the guys were through captain, Captain McGarry was with the other men. He said, you go to that compound and you tell them that Sergeant Caldwell sent you and uh, there's a translator over there and you tell them that I told those guys to find you some footwear for that little, that little kid. It's too cold. And I just, you know, he wasn't doing that to impress me. He's, he's just a good man. And he has told him he didn't want to see that. And, uh, you know, I just, I just like, I, I, I couldn't believe it, you know, and I, you know, I mean, I know the Army's a big thing, and some people act great, and some people don't act great. But what I saw, personally, in that unit, like, I was just, uh, I mean, really stunned. And um, and I, I all and then after that, all I wanted to do was find out more about this. Yeah, it's beautifully told. Uh, let me ask you about your perspective of combat. Uh, we, we talk so much on this podcast about the perspective of guys who sign up for combat. You know, when, when you see, you're referencing, you know, combat from American soldiers for the first time, 
take me through your experience. Uh, you know, I mean, what stood out and what do you remember? And um, what was kind of the, the, the calling card of what you saw from American soldiers? Well, okay. So we were out in, um, you know, out in this sort of badlands, right in Zabal. And uh, they had a, a, the um, scouts, I think, had a couple of Humvees that had like a mark and a 50 on them or something like that. But basically, everyone else was on foot, and they'd lost a Humvee and taken some casualties. Part of the operation was to recover that. So a Chinook was going to come in and lift it out, which is what happened. And then we continued to do some other things. But so when it kicked off, um, RPG went over our head, and then there was some small arms fire. And, and I was, um, you know, I was really shocked. Like, I, I mean, I wasn't quite prepared for it. And, and, uh, because uh, it happened maybe 20 minutes after I stepped off the helicopter, the Black Hawk that dropped us off out there, and um, with some body bags full of food because those guys were starving. But they're they're living on rice, and local chicken, and uh, so they were local goat, something like that. So anyway, literally 20 minutes, 20 minutes after I stepped off the Black Hawk, we, we got hit, and so everyone was super calm, and. I, you know, I didn't know where they were shooting at us from, but they just basically soaked down a whole mountainside with, <laughs> with Mark and 50 and whatever else. And, I, you know, I just, there was an enormous expenditure of ammunition. And, you know, I was like, okay, well, that works. Like, there's plenty more where that came from, so no problem. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, when in, when in doubt, light it up. You know, there's no villages or anything. It's just mountainside, right? So there's no shepherds out in nothing. It was really a wasteland. And, um but the other thing personally was really interesting is there was a guy sitting next and the guy next to me behind this rock and he sort of stood up a little bit and and shot once. And we're you know, he's shooting at, you know, four or five hundred meters away. And I thought, damn, that's so well disciplined of him that he's just taking one well aimed shot in a situation like this, that that's that seemed like incredible training. And I talked to him about it later, and this is the weird tunnel vision you get in combat where you a lot of things drop out. Um, he, I said, "Wow, that he took one one shot. That must, did you hit him? Like what was <laughs> like? Everyone else is unloading their magazines, right? And this guy, and and he and he looked at me like I was crazy. He was like, no, I, 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 I he said I, I went through my whole mag, and I realized that I my mem- I just had, I mean he was right next to me, and I had no memory of him doing that. I remembered one bullet, and I realized I would have sent someone if I were a witness in the you know, murder trial, I would have sent someone in jail on that testimony. Like, I was dead sure that dude took one shot. Dead <laughs> sure. Right. And then then I realized, like, I really am going to have to, um, you know, like, I started shooting video, and I, you know, I realized, like, there's the gap between um, reality and uh, what I remember is so big. It was, it was very interesting to sort of see if I could like see later what dropped out and what I remembered. And it, it was usually quite a difference. That's interesting um, because it's funny when you talk to most soldiers, when we do this, they can recall a lot of things about combat with remarkable accuracy. Um, and I don't know if it's just because they're the ones pulling the trigger or not, as opposed to being bystanders. But for the most part, a lot of guys really have, you know, outside of the concept of time, like how long a battle is actually lasting that nobody has any concept of from, you know, you're just guessing when the first shot is fired through how much 30 minutes is, but they can remember a lot of great details. Does, did that ever surprise you that these guys were able to do that? Well, you know, I mean, yeah, you do remember great details, but that's the problem is you remember the great detail. I mean, that means you're not seeing other things. And sure. so the thing about, I mean, it's not that it was a blur. I had extremely detailed re- recollections of that firefight. Um, too detailed, right? I mean, I was, I mean, you know, in crime scenes, there's something called um, weapon fixation or something like that. You know, someone pulls a handgun out of the convenience store and the only thing anyone sees is the handgun, right? And so there's a little bit of that that goes on. And so... I think if, if soldiers were also videotaping their their combat, um, they would actually realize that, and we're adapted for this, you want to focus very intensely. So I think they would start to realize that there are things that were dropping out because they were focusing on other things. But those things that you focus on, you remember very, very intensely. Um, one of the things I noticed at, at Restrepo was that I, 
it never sounded very loud. And you know, those weapons were loud as hell. Mm-hmm. And I, I read that it, you, the, your, um, you don't need your, 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 you don't need your hearing in a situation like that. And so your body shifts to sight. Like that's the primary uh, way you get information in a crisis like that. And hearing, smell, all that stuff sort of drop out. And it's, it's as if your body does not have the bandwidth to operate all your senses full bore. And it, 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 in a moment like that, and it comes from cortisol and adrenaline and all that stuff, apparently it usually goes with sight. So you have a lot of really specific visual memories and, but the guns won't sound very loud, like, or something like that. Like it's, it's quite confusing. It's funny you brought that up about, uh, you know, videoing things. I, you just jogged a memory with me in my first deployment. Uh, we started, this is before GoPro, GoPro cameras were invented, but we had these cameras you could mount to your helmet. It was kind of like, you know, a long pen that had a camera on the end of it and it, it had a wire yeah. that to a, to a, a box that was, you know, you know, a small box that was maybe about a, a pound or two, but you would strap that thing on your back and, and attach the, the camera to your helmet. And most of the reason that we did it was to actually just get some, uh, you know, feedback on what we were doing. Like it was more like game tape, so to speak, than necessarily right. just for our own personal edification or memories. But uh, it was just funny that you mentioned that. And I can recall looking back at some of the videos and stuff that we saw and you're like, wow, that did, I, I don't even remember that happening. You know, so you, yeah. you do right. forget certain yeah. things when you're, you're, you're kind of going through it. So um, but you know, you, you finish all of, of the journalism stuff. How do you get into movies? Cause you mentioned Restrepo. I want to get into how you started making movies. Well, you know, after, so after 05 and Zabo, I thought if these guys go back to Afghanistan, I want to write a book about a deployment of, of a, you know, one platoon, one deployment. And I really like these guys and I knew the personnel would switch out, but not all of them. And, um, so they wound they wound up back in Afghanistan and, and in uh, Kunar province, and um, I decided if I'm going to spend that much time out there, and if I'm going to be covering a lot of combat where I already knew your memory is um, not that great, uh, and, and, and even if your memory is good, I mean, journalists depend on recording things as they happen. So if you're not writing stuff down in your notebook while someone's speaking, throw the quote out because it's worthless. Like, you really need to be, that kind of accuracy is really important. So what it means is that without a video camera, you're, you're, you're scribbling notes during a firefight and you, you know, you look stupid, you feel stupid and you can't read them later. Like it's just a waste of time. So I thought I'm just going to, I'm going to bring a video camera out there and I'm just going to shoot a lot of video and maybe at the end of the, end of the deployment, I'm not, I'll not only have enough material for a book, um, I'll have, maybe I'll have enough material for a documentary as well. And I didn't know how to make one. I didn't know anything, but, I did know that if you shoot enough video, at least you have a chance of doing that. So that was how that started. And shooting video is not that hard. You know, I mean, uh, you can do it well or not, but getting basically decent video of combat or just of that environment of those guys, like it did not take a lot of fancy shooting. It was pretty intuitive and pretty easy. And and I had the good fortune to work with Tim Hetherington, who came, came on my second trip out there and started shooting video on the third trip. Um, and so he and I became, uh, you know, partners in this project. So when you get back from that deployment, um, and you start, do you start writing first and then do the documentary or were they simultaneous? Oh, uh, no, we started doing the documentary first. I needed some of that material to begin writing because it was a form of note taking for me as well. Sure. Um, and, uh, I was doing a lot of research, um, for my book war, uh, that, you know, that research took about a year. And so I sort of did the research for the book while we were editing Restrepo. Um, the edit for Restrepo took a while. And basically the movie came out in January, 2010. The book came out in, um, May, 2010. And, uh, so that's prior summer of 09. The deployment finished in 08, summer of 08, that prior summer of 09, I was doing both full bore and, um, you know, pretty much a madman for about three or four or five months. Wow. That's impressive. Um, when you look back on that, that deployment for Restrepo, um, any major things jump off the page to you? Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I miss it out there, you know, I mean, uh, but you uh, miss it in uh, Afghanistan. Oh, I miss it enormously. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I've never been part of a small group like that. I mean, that's our, you know, I'm an anthropologist, and that's our evolutionary past and all that is, you know, survival in groups of 20, 30 people. Um, that's what a platoon is doing in combat. And um, I really liked it. And, you know, frankly, a lot of the guys out there, as eager as they were to get back to Vicenza, Italy, where they're based, you know, a lot of them, a lot of them told me that they would have gone back to Restrepo in a heartbeat rather than coming back to the United States. So, I was, um, I was always, always, you know, I came and went. Like Tim and I each did five one month trips, and I was always relieved to go, but also very regretful that I was leaving. And I was always nervous to go back out there, and enormously relieved when I finally got got to that place. Like it was an extraordinary spot for me, anyway, personally. You know, it's funny when you say that um, we hear that sentiment all the time from from guys on the podcast, and especially ones who are injured who have to leave the battlefield and leave their brothers behind, leave their, their, their fellow soldiers, airmen, Marines, whatever it is behind. And that's the worst thing they have. I just, I just wasn't there with my, I wasn't there with my guys. And that, that is a really hard feeling for them to reconcile. It, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's extremely tough. And even if you're not a soldier, I mean, I, you know, I, I form very, very close bonds with those guys. And one of my, I know this is going to sound absurd coming from a civilian, but you know, one of my big fears actually was that, something big would happen when I wasn't there. Sure. And then partly I wanted to be there to capture it on video. But partly, I'm, you know, I, I love those guys. I worried about them. Like, I would have felt um, uh, like I had failed them in some way, even though I never carried a weapon out there, obviously, or anything. They didn't depend on me in any way, except not to screw up, you know. But I still would have felt like I'd failed them or something really, you know, chosen company. You know, they kept getting into some pretty serious ticks. And, yes. And, you know, one of them, when we were out there, you know, they had a, you know, they took 100% casualties in one, you know, one ambush. I mean, they, they really got beat up. And I, I just thought, my God, if that happened to battle company, like, it would have been very, very hard for me emotionally. And, um, so I was always, when I was back home, I was worried. So, you know, I ripped my Achilles out there, and I came home, and I had to get it fixed. And uh, um, so Tim took the next trip, and that was Operation Rock Avalanche, and that was a tough week for everybody, and they took a bunch of casualties and Tim broke his leg um, on that operation at night coming down off the Abascar. And so I got a phone call this morning um, from someone at ABC, I think, saying that a uh, bunch of casualties, Tim had broken his leg, but he was all right. And, you know, I was in my apartment in New York and I just felt, I mean, I felt awful that I wasn't there. I felt absolutely ghastly. I really worried about Tim. He was my buddy. You know, like I was responsible for him. And vice versa. And it really was an awful feeling. So how did you handle when there was a casualty or someone was killed in action? Well, I mean, thank God. Uh, I, I was not, I was never there. Uh, the casualties were, there were two casualties. There was one casualty, I think almost on the first day of the deployment. I came a few days later. Restrepo was killed um, in July and there were no casualties until the fall. And, um, uh, and that was, um, you know, that was the trip that Tim was on. And a guy was killed out of Vegas, but I was never out there. And then someone else was killed out of Alibaba, but I wasn't there. So, yes, you know, it's possible as a journalist or a soldier to go through a whole deployment and have there be a bunch of casualties, and you're just not standing next to the guy. And you never see him. You know, like, they just, they're gone. And so, so that, that's what happened to me. And then I have to say, I'm, you know, not, um, I'm not at all sorry that it happened that way. I think it would be extremely hard thing, uh, to see, you know, an American, a fellow American get killed in a situation like that. And particularly, you know, towards the end of the deployment, I knew all those guys so well. And I, you know, had one of those guys gotten hurt, I mean, I just, I, it would have been unbelievably hard on me. Like it would have been, like it would have been hard on all of his, all of his buddies. When you talk to the guys there about the casualties, because I'm sure you did, what was the sentiment you got and what was the reaction you got? And, you know, I mean, obviously it wasn't hard for you to relate, as you've explained, but just give me some more on there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, you know, I talk about that stuff a little later in the deployment because I wanted to, you know, I wanted a certain level of trust. You know, it takes a while for to be accepted in a platoon and for people to know each other and trust you. And so I, I brought that stuff up a little bit later. Uh, and it was extremely emotional. And, you know, months, some months had gone by, right? And, and uh, 
you know, a very, very emotional topic. And, and I know that, you know, I know that now myself, like Tim, you know, Tim was killed in Libya in 2011. So we went to the Oscars together with Restrepo. We were going to go on assignment for Vanity Fair and cover the Arab Spring, uh, particularly the war in Libya. And the last minute I couldn't go for personal reasons. He went on his own. I was really worried about him. And he got killed in Misrata. Oh. He took a mortar, mortar fragment in the hip and bled out. And, uh, so I, um, you know, I got that phone call in New York and, you know, I was 6,000 miles away and it wasn't my fault and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I still feel guilty about it. And, uh, it should have been me. I should have been there to save him. I should have been there to, whatever. I mean, it just doesn't even make sense. But you No, it care. does. That's the thing. Like, Sebastian, honestly, like, it, it makes sense to all of us who listen to this. Anybody who puts on a uniform makes sense to all of us. Like, we, we, we yeah. uh, it's not empathy. It's, it's sympathy. We understand it completely. Yeah, and it's a funny thing. You know, had Tim gotten killed um, driving down the highway in this country, I would not have felt guilty. And had Tim not been my buddy over there, I would not have felt guilty. We were just another journalist. You know, I wouldn't have felt guilty. But he was my, you know, he was my buddy in combat. We were in combat together. And then he died in combat, and that made it my fault. And a car accident would not have felt that way. And it's really interesting how it works. And so now I, you know, like, I mean, someone brings it up. And I'll, you know, I never know. Sometimes I'm fine, like right now. Sometimes I get super emotional, like I can't talk about it. And um, so, like when those guys, when the, the guys in Second Platoon were, getting, a couple of them getting emotional about some of the deaths that happened. Um, you know, I now I now understand it. I mean, damn, it's been what are we? 2018. It's been uh, seven years since Tim was killed, and I still I never know. Time, you know, depending. I never know from time to time. Like, am I going to just get choked up and not be able to talk about it? You know, it's. I mean, it's clear for people who who listen that you know. I mean, this is PTSD to you know at its core. And I've read some of your other columns and writings uh, on it uh, for Vanity Fair and other ones uh, about PTSD and what it's done in, in your experience, both personal and what you have viewed and covered. Um, what do you? How debilitating is PTSD? Well, I, you know, you have to tease apart different parts of it. Like grief and guilt is a component of it. Um, uh, depression is a component of it. Depression, I think, that partly comes from leaving that unit you were with and coming back to the United States into this sort of like individualized society where you're not really part of anything. You know, that, and that, strictly speaking, is PTSD. It's, it's a transition disorder that can result in depression. Uh, grief also, unresolved grief, you know, is his own sort of diag- it's his own diagnosis, it's his own phenomenon. But but strictly speaking, reaction to trauma um, can come, you know, the grief and depression, the transition, you know, whatever, that can be part of it. But but just being being very very precise here, being traumatized, either having your life uh, threatened or um, nearly losing your life or seeing harm come to others, uh, particularly seeing harm come to others, uh, to, to civilians, to your brothers, to your friends, even to the enemy, frankly. To see the human body dismembered um, in, in by, you know, munitions of war, which I've seen, it's incredibly disturbing. And so your reactions to that trauma is very, very intense for a few weeks and a few months. And typically, about 80% of people after they've been traumatized um, Will will very slowly but steadily improve until they're after a year or so. Typically, for most people, like eighty percent of people, they're uh, indistinguishable from normal after a year. About twenty percent of people continue in a kind of trauma loop that keeps aggravating itself, and, and that can that can go for years or a lifetime. And um, I think what's particularly hard is to be traumatized in a group like a platoon in combat. And then to be recovering on your own. Um, the times I've been really traumatized of war it was not how I was trouble with those guys. Uh, it was in Afghanistan in 2000, and then some of the wars in West Africa. And you know, I was traumatized by myself. Basically, I wasn't part of a unit. I was booked around on my own, and I came home on my own and recovered on my own. And and I, I, you know, I just I kept having panic attacks, but I didn't know why. I had no idea it was PTSD. This was before 9/11, so I. Like, I didn't even know the term. 
I, you know, I just thought I was going crazy, but I was I had panic attacks, like I couldn't take the subway, things like that. I couldn't get an elevator, things like that. And uh, but it went away. You know, eventually it went away. I think soldiers have a particularly hard time because they're being pulled out of the unit that they're in and brought home. And I think that actually adds a transition disorder to the trauma that really can get guys stuck. No, and I think that's you know very lucid. Um, there, there's a lot of things about. Um, transition and decompression uh, that that are hard, you know. Just a, a personal note: when I got back to my first deployment, like I, I was so used to having a weapon on me that to not yeah. have one freaked me out yeah. to all. Like I literally had to start carrying a knife with me everywhere just because I wanted some form of. Even though I'm in the United States and nobody theoretically should come up to me and attack me, I just I I, I wasn't allowed to carry a gun everywhere. I needed some form of of protection, and and it took me a while to let that go because I just. I felt like I needed something, you know, because th- there was always something lurking over my shoulder. I mean, it's just, it's, you can't escape some of that stuff. Yeah. And you not only did you not have a weapon, you didn't have anyone around you. Right. I mean, you weren't, <laughs> you weren't part of a group anymore. Right. And, um, I think that's, I mean, you know, we're social, we're social primates, we're a social species. We get our safety from being part of a group. You know, we, humans, die in nature, right? I mean, they don't survive on their own in nature. They die in survival groups. So if you're in a platoon in combat and you're used to the, your sense of security coming from the fact that you're part of a, 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 a unit, that's where your sense of safety comes from. And so you can be in a very dangerous place in a platoon and feel quite confident that you, you, you and your buddies are going to know how, what to do, right? Then you come back to the United States, there's no obvious danger, but you're all alone. And that can feel more threatening and more dangerous than combat with your guy, with, in your unit. And that's one of the ironies of war is that soldiers can, I think, feel in some ways safer on the front lines with guys they trust than, you know, in the great American suburb where there's no real threat, but they're alone. No, we say it all the time. It's just a matter of control. For whatever reason, you feel like you have some semblance of control in all the chaos of war. And yet you have less control in normal everyday life because you just, as you you know pointed out, there's not a lot of the things that are at your disposal in combat at your disposal in everyday life. Right. That's right. Yeah, it's really hard. It's really hard. So how are you nowadays with everything? I mean, how do you feel like, you, I don't know if the right term is recovered or healed. I mean, uh, because you, you went through everything you went through and had PTSD and then you walked into combat and saw a whole different level of things that probably resurfaced a lot of feelings, no? Well, what was interesting with the um, uh, second platoon was that I had never been in combat in a group with people that I trusted that really came to care care about. And that was a whole new experience. And I got to say, it really took the edge off the fear. I mean, if you're alone in a civil war, not alone, but if you're sort of on your own in a civil war, like I was in Liberia or Sierra Leone, like that's really scary. And I've been in combat with, you know, when I was with American soldiers, and it's intense and it's scary, but it, you're, you're sort of all in it together. And and there's something about that that makes the fear manageable. Fear is um, very, very hard to manage when you when you feel like you're dealing with, with a threat to your life by yourself. And um, so, uh, you know, that was all, I was in Cornwall Valley, that was all fine. I mean, I, I, I knew I was taking my chances, and, you know, I could get hit by something, I mean, the first firefight out there, a bullet hit you know, a few inches from my forehead, and he was sandbag. You know, that was the first round of the first burst of the, you know, an hour-long firefight. And, you know, so I, you know, you know, that can happen, but I didn't experience fear in the same way that I did when I was on my own. Some of those other wars, and and then I, uh, you know, and then they, like I said, you know, for most people, trauma eventually sort of solves itself, and uh, it certainly did for me. But that doesn't mean you're not changed. I mean, I'm enormously changed by my exposure to combat in a lot of good ways and, and some ways that aren't that pleasant, but I, but I wouldn't say in any way that my life is impaired by PTSD. Like it's just, I'm a fully functional person. Um, and it makes sense, you know, like if trauma in evolutionary terms, it makes sense. If, if trauma were completely psychologically incapacitating to a large proportion of people, the human race wouldn't survive, wouldn't have survived. It wouldn't exist. Um, you know, it, it makes sense that people react to trauma by withdrawing, by protecting themselves psychologically and physically, and then after some weeks or months, they sort of come out of their shell and they resume functionality. I mean, evolution sort of demands that people function. And, uh, so so for most people, it resolves itself in due time. 
You mentioned that you're changed in, in, in a good way from all your experiences. I heard you say in the beginning that you talked about you kind of had a, a bad experience or view of the military because of Vietnam and everything else. What is your current view of the military now that you've been through all these experiences? Yeah, and I, I wouldn't say it was bad. I just didn't, I, you know, it was a Vietnam seemed like a war that, I mean, all the adults I knew when I was a kid were against it, right? So it seemed like a war that we maybe didn't need to fight. It seemed like a huge tragedy. The, the soldiers seemed like, um, uh, you know, they seemed like they were really the sort of victims of a, of a government that wasn't looking out for them. And um, uh, and I didn't know any soldiers, you know. I, right. And I, you know, I grew up in liberal Northeast, you know, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Like I just didn't know any. So I knew I knew a bunch of soldiers from World War Two. Like the whole generation above me fought in World War Two. That was sort of seemed different. So um, I really didn't know what to expect. I, you know, I somehow had the idea that they would be like uh, they they wouldn't seem quite like individuals, like the army sort of. I had the idea that sort of molded people into sort of cookie cutter, like sort of cookie cutter robots that sort of did what they were told. And, you know, obviously nothing could be further from the truth. And uh, so that, you know, that was, that was clear immediately. And, and, you know, the, the quality of the, not only the enlisted men, but the officers, my God, those are smart people, you know, I mean, really Captain McGarry was unbelievably smart. Like Dan Kearney too. I mean, every officer I met was like really impressive guy. And, uh, so it wasn't that I thought that they weren't before. You know, I didn't. I didn't really have an expectation. But when I met them, I was, I was, I was really, really, really impressed by them. Now that you've been through all these experiences, uh, I mean, I, I assume you would go back if offered the opportunity, or are you kind of retired from that point in your career? Uh, you know, I would love to, but um, you know, I, I, after Tim got killed, I stopped war reporting, and uh, you know, mostly because I saw what his death did to everyone who loved him. And I didn't want to be, I didn't want to do that to my people. You know, like it was, suddenly became clear to me, like, oh, this, you're not gambling with your life, man. You're gambling with everyone else's lives. Yeah. You know? And so I, you know, when it, when that clicked, you know, had that clicked at age 30, I would have ignored it, but it clicked at age 50. You know, I'm like, all right, shit, I could, I, I'm not doing this anymore, so. <laughs> so it's a very fair so judgment. Be, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't be selfish your whole life, you know, like, and, and so, um, and now, you know, my wife and I have a little girl. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm absolutely, I mean, I miss those days a lot. Trust me. Like I really miss it. It was incredibly powerful, important time in my life, but I wouldn't want to go back to that. Uh, it would feel, um, I don't know. It would feel like I was being, uh, uh, wasteful in some ways of, um, something really precious, which is my, you know, my family. I know this is a question like kind of asking, you know, what, which is your favorite kid, uh, which you know, everyone knows the answer to, but when you, look back on your catalog of work that you've done, both written and video and everything else, uh, film and whatnot. D does any one, do you feel like any one had more of an impact than another? Well, uh, you know, Tribe was the most, um, you know, Tribe takes on my, the entire society that I grew up in and critiques it. And so, uh, you know, no other book does that. I mean, it's, it was a pretty, um, it's sort of an, amb an ambitious book in that sense. And so I, you know, I think that it had more of an impact than any of the other books because I wasn't, you know, the other books were sort of topical. They were about something, right? Mm -hmm. you no know, tribe was a reexamination of the society that we all live in and what's good about it, what's bad about it. And, um, so I, you know, I, even though it's the shortest book, it, I would think it would have the most impact on people's lives. I think war, my book war I think it actually, I've heard it was quite helpful for soldiers and veterans and also spouses of soldiers and veterans to understand the experience. Um, How does that make you feel so when I'm, you hear that? I'm, I'm super proud. I mean, really, um, I know how, what a emotional burden the experience of war could be. And also, you can feel like you've been kind of blessed by it when you're touched by it. And uh, both of those things can be very problematic in a marriage. And I remember one young woman came up to me and said, you know, if I'd read your book more before the divorce, she was married to a, you know, someone who had been in a combat unit. She said, if I'd read your book more before the divorce, we might not have gotten divorced. Like you really explained something important that, he, that apparently even her ex-husband couldn't really explain very well. 
And so that, you know, things like that, I mean, you want to be of service, you know, as a journalist, as any, as anything, I suppose, you want to be of service. And that to me was me being sort of of some service to my um, fellow, fellow citizens. Well, on that note, you know, uh, the note of service that is, uh, I think it's a good way to, to just thank you for all that you've done, um, you know, the perspective and everything that you've told throughout the course of your career. As you said, uh, for this podcast and its listeners, at least have had a, a profound impact on the military. And um, I, I think that, you know, when you look at everything that you've done, uh, the more that you can shed some light on uh, the positive things that go on through combat, because there's a lot of negative, as you know. Um, but the, yeah. the the bonds of brotherhood and, and and what war does to to soldiers and men and women and everybody who's part of it, um, there is some good that comes out of it, even if uh, you know all the evils doesn't subside from the whole thing. But from that standpoint, I, I think you have you've created a, a light where there was darkness, and for that, I you know that, that's just gratitude. Thank you so much for saying that. I really that means a lot to me. I, I really appreciate that. Sebastian Younger, thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground Podcast. My pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.